The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Oosteros here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with another Wheat School episode, and I have here with me John Gavlosky, who is an extension entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture. How is it going today? Very good, Kara. Now we're at the time of the year we're starting to talk insect forecasts for 2022. One of the uh, big ones across the prairies always is a top of mind is grasshoppers. Uh, you've looked a lot at some of the grasshopper forecasts. What what can you tell me? Well, yes, we do a forecast annually. In fact, all of the prairie provinces do an annual grasshopper forecast. Now, the tricky part with the forecasting of grasshoppers, what we actually do is we go out in August and we do counts of grasshopper populations along usually field edges, roadsides, and we produce a map based on those counts. So that's a snapshot of the egg laying population in August. The tricky part is that doesn't always relate to what happens next year. And sometimes I've found in the past few years we've underestimated what the population might be the next year. So we do have a map that we produce based on our August counts. But I often caution people, um, we do like to factor in a lot of other things, uh, weather during the egg laying period, which is August and September, natural enemies that are present, and just trends, what's been happening over the past few years. So in a nutshell, what we saw this year um, populations were once again on the increase. So over the past four or five years, we've been seeing some building populations. The maybe misleading part to the map, there's a lot of green on the map, especially in the western part of Manitoba, which might imply low risk. But based on what I know was happening in those regions with grasshoppers, I like to factor that into the forecast as well. Um, I would say... Uh, most of the province should be expecting at least some moderate levels, if not some higher levels, going into 2022. And to just start scouting for the uh, the young nips in late May and early June. Now, Manitoba has seen a significant amount of snow this past uh, winter. How how does that impact grasshopper populations? Does that have any anything to do with it? If anything, the snow is an ally to the grasshoppers because um, all of our pest species overwinter as eggs. And they're usually about um, five centimeters roughly in the soil. So about two inches down in the soil. And if we have absolutely no snow cover, um, they're more likely to get the temperatures that could kill the eggs. So it, you, you need to get down to about minus 15 degrees or lower for a significant period of time to get mortality of the grasshopper eggs. Once they hit that minus 15, they can't survive too long. But if you have even a few inches of snow on top of the soil, you rarely get down to minus 15 degrees a couple inches into the soil. So the snow, if anything, by providing good insulation, um, will keep those grasshopper eggs alive until they hatch. Now, what about uh, when we start looking into spring? I mean, the lots of the prairies seen a lot of drought over last year, so of course we're going to hope for some rain, but I think when it comes to grasshoppers, uh, how, how is that going to play? Yeah, so moisture really impacts grasshopper dynamics and levels quite a bit. Now, first of all, all this snow that we've got is going to melt. We've got a lot of snow in Manitoba. It's going to melt. We're going to have flooded ditches and possibly some very wet fields for a while before the moisture is all gone. Um, one thing to note with grasshoppers, though, in the egg stage, they're very resilient and they can handle being underwater for a period of time. Um, a, a colleague of mine once told me that he took grasshopper eggs, put them in water for a week, poured the water out, and the eggs all hatched. So they can sit underwater for a little while. So if your ditches are all full of water in the spring, don't assume that the hopper eggs are all dead. They're very resilient. They'll start hatching out, depending on the temperature, usually it's late May or into June. But we get a warmer spring, it could be late May. Cooler spring, very early June. That's when the hatch will start. 
that's when a lot of moisture can really um, knock their population back. They're at their most vulnerable stage right after they hatch. As they get bigger and bigger, they once again become a bit more resilient. And they actually thrive if we get some drier conditions. Um, there's fungal pathogens that if it's a very damp summer, fungal pathogens can sometimes kill some of the grasshoppers. Um, the, 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 the warm temperatures will speed up their development. In a dry summer, it uh, gives them perfect uh, conditions to build their populations. Now, elaborate on another thing you guys look at is some of the dominant species. Do you want to elaborate on which ones you kind of were seeing pop up in Manitoba? Sure. And um, just to put it into context, we've got roughly 85 species of grasshoppers in Manitoba. There's four we consider to be pest species because they can build their populations up very rapidly when conditions are right. And their egg laying isn't really limited like some of the non-pest species. Of these four potential pest species, there is one we call the clear wing grasshopper. It only likes to feed on grassy plants. So this is why it's good to know your, your grasshoppers a little bit. If it's clear wing that's dominant in an area, they will go after your pasture grasses, your cereals, your forage grasses. They won't touch your canola, your soybeans, sunflowers, any of your broadleaf crops. Now, what we found when we did our survey was in most areas, two-striped grasshopper remained a dominant species. It's a generalist. It feeds on, it's got its favorites, but it'll feed on just about anything. It's like us at a buffet. We've got our favorite foods, but if they're not there, we then go down the line to our next favorites. And with two-striped, like I said, nothing is really um, off the board. Um, another one that was somewhat dominant in the west of the province was migratory, especially in the northwest. Uh, a lot of migratory grasshoppers, and just like two-striped, very um, broad appetite. The clear wing grasshopper that I talked about, the grass specialist, we had some pockets in the interlake where they were quite dominant, and there were a few areas in the central region where we were seeing them as well. Uh, one of the guidelines we have is that if you can get your seeding done as early as possible, um, bigger, more established crops can often tolerate the damage better, there's many factors other than grasshoppers that will factor into when things get seeded. Um, some people may choose to plant a crop that's a bit more uh, grasshopper resilient, I guess. Um, you know, the cereals, oats tends to be a bit uh, less preferred than wheat or barley. But again, people have um, reasons why they want to seed particular crops. Uh, peas are another one that grasshoppers... Um, won't feed on as much, but I should uh, also mention that when there's a lot of them and they're hungry, they will definitely cause damage in oats and peas and some of those crops that we consider to be a bit more grasshopper tolerant. So you still have to watch those crops. Now, I know you're also a part of the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network where you guys look at uh, some of the beneficial insects as well. Do you guys have all these maps located there or where do you, uh, people find these forecast maps? So we've got our, our, our grasshopper forecast maps on our provincial websites and they also get posted on our Prairie Pest Monitoring Network website as well. Um, regarding the beneficials, we don't produce maps of the beneficials, but we but in Manitoba, we do factor those into our forecast. And we at least make mention of some of the dominant um, predators of grasshoppers that we're seeing. And this past season, we were seeing a lot of, uh, there's a, a big hairy fly called a bee fly. And they call them bee flies because they look like, almost like bumblebees in, in a certain regard. They're very hairy flies, but they're not bees, they're flies. And Beef, there's certain species of bee flies that only uh, eat grasshopper eggs in the, when they're in their larval stage. So the adult bee fly will actually watch where the grasshoppers are laying their eggs, lay their eggs nearby, and when the bee fly eggs hatch up, they feed on nothing but grasshopper eggs. So we were seeing a lot of those. Good. There's also a couple species of blister beetles in Manitoba that uh, same thing. The larvae of those species of blister beetles eat nothing but grasshopper eggs. These are a black and a gray species of blister beetle. And there was quite a few of them. I was getting calls from uh, concerned agronomists wondering, what are all these blister beetles <laughs> going to do to my crop? And they, they definitely will feed on um, flowers, alfalfa flowers, 
leaves of some crops, soybean leaves. But usually they're in, in patches, they're very patchy. And I always caution people, yeah, they will do a little bit of feeding, usually not economical, but their good side is their larvae feed on nothing but grasshopper eggs. So it's good to take note when these things are becoming a bit more numerous. Absolutely. Okay, anything else you would like to uh, tell producers that might be watching this? Uh, just to um, start scouting for grasshoppers early. And so what I mean uh, early, it's late May, early June. At that time of year, you're looking for really tiny hatching grasshoppers. When, when they first hatch up, they're about three to five millimeters long. So they're tiny little things, not much bigger than a wheat kernel. Then they'll progressively get bigger and bigger. Uh, any grasshoppers you see prior to about late May. Sometimes you see some larger grasshoppers in uh, May. Those are not pest species. And you often see those on, in places like pastures and maybe sometimes meadows, roadsides. So anything that's big in May is not a pest species. If they've got colored hind wings, when they fly and open their wings, if it's orange or yellow or black, it's pest species and if they make a sound when they fly they're not a pest species other than that you're looking for tiny little grasshoppers hatching out late may through june keep an eye on those levels and if you notice you've got a very big population on the field edge or somewhere uh it's much easier and much cheaper to deal with them when they're juveniles than when they're adults later okay sounds good thank you very much for your time john okay thank you very much